Do you need your own boom kit if you're going to be a boom operator? The answer is no, you don't have to. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, I was taking a class from one of the top boom operators in the world, a guy who has been booming over four decades and still going strong as a career boom op. And I asked him, what do you have in your boom kit? He kind of grinned, looked to the side and says, I don't really have my own gear. I just use the mixer stuff. Granted, he's been working with the same mixer for almost four, four decades. Well, the mixer recently retired and he's been working with other people. Who knows? Maybe by now he has his own boom. But that particular boom operator constantly worked with that one mixer and maintained that mixer's gear. A lot of the time when you go to work for a mixer, if you don't have your own boom pole and boom kit, you're using the mixer stuff. And mixers don't usually maintain the boom, the shock mounts, that kind of thing. They'll rely on their boom operators to do that for them and tell them if there's an issue with it. But that's not always the case if a boom operator has their own stuff and they bring their own stuff, it's going to age on the truck and maybe need some TLC before you're going to be using it. Now, if you use a boom operator, if you use a boom from a sound mixer, it is going to be covered by your production insurance. It's going to be part of their, their sound package that they're providing to production. You don't have to pay for the maintenance of it at all. That's great. There's a lot that can be said for starting the first day on a job, walking in there with nothing in your hands and starting the job. And then on the very last day of the show, say, okay, thanks very much. Great. Had a great show and leaving with your wrap gifts. There's a lot that can be said for that, but that is not necessarily something that you are going to be satisfied with. For me, the moment I decided to get my own boom was when a mixer told me that I would never boom for him again unless I had my own kit, because to him, it was a very serious thing. And I thought about it after that. And I kind of put it in perspective, and it, and it is true that if you go to work for a mixer, you are using whatever. Now, granted, you can, as a professional boom operator, like I can, I have my own preference of pole and everything, but I should be able to go and pick up any boom and use any shock mount and any microphone and be able to use those and get great results with it. And I can. But in order for me to feel most comfortable with what I have in my hands, I have to have the things that are most, most in line with my preferences. Boom poles, for example, is the tool that you use all, are, are the tools that you use all day long. If you have a dryer hand, if you have oilier hands, um, that's going to affect the way the pole handles in your hands. If you like to wear gloves, if you don't like to, if you death grip the pole, which you shouldn't do, sometimes you'll hear your heart beat through a pole and you don't want to have a pole that you can hear your heartbeat through. Some, some poles you cannot internally coil. Some poles you cannot internally straight cable. Some only have to be externally wrapped, but some are also more flexible and some are more bendy. The, uh, the, the knuckles and collars, um, the locks, everything about them is different on different brands. Some poles, as you extend them out, they have little markers on them, like the, v, uh, like the, the newer VDBs have markers on there. As a matter of fact, the newer VDBs have a quarter lock system where you just have to turn it a quarter of a lock and it, and then, uh, and it loosens and you stick it out and, and then you quarter it, turn it again and it locks again. Some poles, like an ambient, if it's well maintained, you don't even have to do a quarter of a, of a lock and it will lock like a, a death grip and it will release with about an eighth of a turn. Other poles, like a panamic, you cannot internally coil at all. So you better like externally wrapping your pole or putting a transmitter on the end of your shock mount. There's a lot of things to know about boom poles. And if your boom is provided by the mixer, it may not be well maintained. You have to do the maintenance on there. And who knows the last time it was done because your boom operators that the boom operators before you who use that, it may have been a few years because they might have been using their own stuff. That's why I say you don't have to necessarily use your uh, your own gear, but it is always helpful. It's it's covered under production insurance on the sound mixer. That's another thing that's very good. If you provide your own stuff as part of a boom kit, chances are because you're getting paid for it, you're going to be asked to sign a little document that says that if there's any damage done to it, you're going to be responsible. Some productions will still pay for that damage out of the production um, if, if it's damaged on the show. I had a circumstance a few years ago where I was using my own poles. I was not getting a kit rental, but it got damaged by a camera operator that ran straight into me and broke uh, broke my pole because he hit, he, he hit the end of my pole. It actually quickly snapped, you know, it quickly whipped because he hit the end of it. It went around my body and of course whipped the end of the pole and with the heavy Zeppelin I had up there, which was a Norman KMR 82i, it basically was dead stuck out there and the pole whipped and broke the end of my boom. Well, production all saw that and they decided to cover that and repair it for me. That doesn't always happen though. 
It does sometimes happen, but not always. It's something that if you have your own kit, you have to be aware of. But let me tell you another story here. A mixer I worked with when I decided I was going to buy my own boom. He had a very creaky VDB pole. It was old. It made a lot of noise, but the locks on it were really good. So if I put something up there, no matter if it was a heavy Zeppelin or a light, light microphone, it would not it would not spin upside down because if you have a Zeppelin that's supposed to point downwards and it's top heavy, then of course, if you don't have good locks, it's going to spin and flip upside down. That's not a good thing. I mean, I mean, if you want to hear airplanes or you're under booming, then that's fine. But most of the time we don't, we over boom. And that particular pole drove me nuts. Well, we needed a second boom because, you know, you sometimes have scenes where you have to second boom. And the mixer decided to rent a, a PSC Elite. And that was a great pole, except that the locks did not work properly on there. They didn't lock. So when I was inside using a light microphone, I could use the PSC. It was quiet and I was able to get great results with it. When we went outside though, and if I put a Zeppelin on that, no matter how much I cranked that thing down, which I didn't want to have to do, it did not lock properly and the microphone would flip straight up in the sky. So I had to use the VDB outside and deal with the creakiness. That mixer though was very quick to point out anytime that microphone creaked. And I did not like that. I was driven nuts by it. So I decided to buy my own gear. That in combination with the other story I told you. Those two things happened back to back, and it kind of gave me uh, an indication that I need to get my own gear. I needed to do that in order for me to take my job seriously as a boom op. Let me tell you this. I'll put it to you this way, rather. If you were hiring a handyman to build a deck on the back of your house, and you have two people coming in there, and one guy shows up and he says, okay, I can do it for this amount of money. By the way, do you have a table saw? Do you have a hammer? You have uh, you know, maybe a, you know, screwdriver set and that kind of thing. Okay, great. And then another guy shows up, same exact price, but says, oh, no, 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 I have all my own tools. I'll, I'll make it with the tools I have. Who are you more likely going to take, if everything else is equal, who are you going to take more seriously? Probably the guy with his own gear. Not, not because that particular person is more professional, not because that person has more skills, but because they bring their own tools and because they are going to have the pro stuff, they need to do their job. And you're going to most likely trust that person to know their tools better. Same thing with a boom operator. I can certainly use any gear that's put in my hands, but the stuff that's in my hands that I like, that I, that I bought because it fits well in my hands and I handle it well and I like it the best, that's the stuff that's going to give me most likely the best results personally at least, and it will give you the most satisfaction about working. If like for, <laughs> I'll tell you another quick story, a lot of stories today. A few years ago, I was working with a mixer and I had already pre got pre-approved to start another show. That show pushed a couple of weeks and I was able to basically not do, I, I was going to, I, I agreed to do a certain amount of the show, but um, I actually ended up staying until the just before the last week of the show uh and and then i had to bail because the mixer knew hiring me up front that i was going to have to start this other show but the boom operator that he had hired to fill in for me that last week did not have a pole so he said do you have a pole that he could use i said sure you know because the mixer didn't have one and um so i provided one and Within the first few hours, that boom operator was driven nuts because he is used to very light poles, and the only one they had was a very heavy pole, which is the brand that I like. It's heavier, it's stiffer, it's, it's more responsive, at least to me. You know, it's my preference. But to him, it was not what he needed. He, he needed a different type of pole. But, and, and, and it was that point when he was like, I'm just going to have to buy my own. This is driving me nuts. I can't use this pole. That does happen. You have to have your own gear in order to know what you expect every single day on a show. So what goes into a boom kit? Well, the very minimum boom kit you need is a boom pole and a set of headphones. I mean, really, I mean, technically just a boom, but you ought to at least have a boom that uh, and some headphones. That's a minimum of what I usually consider to be a boom kit. Now, Ideally, you would have a couple of different sizes of boom. Maybe the first one you get should be about an 18, you know, 16 to 20 feet, let's say 16, 20 footer. That will most likely get you most of the stuff that you need, you know, most of the shots you need to do. 
but sometimes you're going to be in a small, a shorter environment and you need a smaller pole. And it's if you have a 20 foot pole, let's say, you don't have to extend it out 20 feet every single shot. You could have a shot that's only about, it's extended out seven or eight feet. And then why hold all this extra pole? It's ideal then to get your second pole that's shorter, like maybe a 10 or 12 footer. So that way you can rely on the 10 or 12 footer and use that one anytime that, that, that you don't need more than that. And then rely on the longer pole if you have to extend out longer. Now, that is personally what I recommend to people is get the big pole and then get a shorter pole. Some people have gone ahead and bought a shorter pole and said, well, I'll use the mixtures if I need a longer, uh, a longer pole. But I usually say get the one that you're going to most likely use all the time and then use the shorter one because the circumstances when you need a, sh a shorter pole, shorter than the minimum distance of your actual boom itself, are seldom. They're fewer. I mean, you'll run into those if you're shooting on an elevator, if you're shooting in a very small room, for example, and you need to get around a light or, you know, something like that in a hall, you're doing a walk and talk, maybe. Um, you might need to have a, a shorter pole just because you can't make all the turns. Um, but, you know, that's a totally different thing altogether, how I'm getting ahead of myself. What I usually tell people to get, though, and, and to keep as part of their minimal boom kit are things like you need a foul weather bag. If the weather starts to go bad, if, for example, things get very cold, you might need to have a jacket that is constantly there. The bigger worry about uh, that you need to prepare for a foul weather ki kit with, with a foul weather kit is rain. You will most likely be in a circumstance and it's going to come down raining and production says, we're not, we don't have a cover set. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to shoot in the rain. If you want to be standing out there in your clothes and getting rained on all day, more power to you. That's fine. Disregard what I'm about to say. But if you are not really liking that, then get yourself a rain jacket, get yourself some rain pants, get yourself some rain boots or shoes, something like uh, Neos are personally something that I like. Neos basically fit over your regular shoe. It's, an, it's what's called an overshoe. And you basically slide it up and it's, it's got like nylon material on the outside. Um, you slide your whole foot with the shoe and everything on it into the sock, I guess you could say, almost like the boot, and then just slide your foot in there and then, vel uh, not Velcro, but secure it on top of your foot and then, you know, run the nylon up. The whole thing is like one big piece. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's waterproof all the way through. And then you secure it at the top and put it inside of your, uh, your waterproof pants and you're good to go. I have worn my Neos before when I was doing a show last year and crew parking, um, had water that was about six inches deep to get to the actual uh, studio that we were shooting in. And then for whatever crazy reason, the caterers were set up at the other side of the parking lot where it went to about eight inches deep. Not very many people were visiting catering that day, but I did. I just put on the Neos and trampled right on through it. Foot never got wet on the inside of that, those Neos. Now, you can also maybe use waterproof boots. As a matter of fact, the brand that I usually use are Magnum. Now, you don't have to get Magnum boots. You can get whatever you want. But the reason I chose those is because, in my opinion, you go to a place that that sells military and police issue stuff, and chances are those guys have to, have got to be standing in water. They've got to be keep their feet dry in those conditions. You can trust the kind of stuff they're going to wear. So the Magnum boot brand is something that I got for that reason. Um, of course, I went to REI and got the uh, the jacket that I like. I went to uh, and, and the pants that I like. And of course, I only wear black on set. So I had to get a, a set that worked for me there. Um, that's really what you would need. I do have additional rain stuff, but you know, I won't necessarily go into that here. Maybe in a live stream sometime. Um, now, another thing to keep in mind is that if you're wearing some sort of a of a head cover, like you're wearing, you know, you have your hood up on your rain jacket, you might consider getting a hat with a bill because if you wear that and you tighten it up through here and so that your face is just sticking out like this, rain is still going to be coming down and hitting you in the face. And when you're booming, you're going to be like, you know, driven nuts by it. And if you turn your face on the inside without securing it as tightly, you know, here's the hole. You're like going to be trying to see around that thing. And trying to boom like that, it's going to drive you crazy. So have the bill sticking out there. Put that on your head. Then pull the, th the, 
the actual hood over that and secure it around your face. That way, your face is sticking out, and if you turn, the bill actually keeps it out of your eyes, which is cool. Um, that's a little little tip I picked up. But um, uh, as, as far as anything else, for a minimal kit, you don't really need to have anything more, really. A boom pole, headphones, and probably a foul weather bag is usually about the minimum, I would say. What I usually carry is, and I'll, I'll go through a whole bunch of other things real quick, just to at least give you an idea of some of the other things that you can have. Shorter boom poles, of course. Longer boom poles, if you really want to be crazy. I carry my own quick, uh, quick locks, quick releases. And uh, that way, whichever mixture I'm working with, I, I can switch those out and uh, use the brand that they have and still use my pole. That way I don't have to ask them if I could borrow some or you know, freak out because they don't have any. Um, another thing to, uh, to think about is maybe a change of clothes because you might be in a circumstance where there's very messy stuff happening. There might be using diatomaceous earth to, you know, shoot all over the place to make it look dirty. And if that's the case, it can be very, very, you know, bad to stay on those all, uh, those clothes all day long. No, you're not gonna have insects on you because diatomaceous earth kills it. But, you know, you don't necessarily want to wear dusty, dirty clothes all day. You can if you want and just, you know, brush you off, but, you know, you might consider carrying a, ch a change of clothes because you never know. I mean, sometimes you might, you know, be dealing with a, a quick flash rain and your foul weather gear bag may be on the truck that, that's far away. And so it's good to have a change of clothes for that reason. That's always helpful. Um, I also carry my own shock mounts because I've gotten used to certain ones and I wanted to make sure they were always available to me. As a matter of fact, I got heavily, heavily praised from a very top-notch mixer that I day played with a few years ago because I said, what microphone are we going to be using? And I got kind of an answer, you know, because I was just day playing. They're like, what does that matter? I'm like, because I carry my own shock mounts. And they told me, and I said, okay. And I brought my own boom pole. I brought my own shock mount, and that way I had it. And they were like, you carry your own shock mounts? I'm like, sure do. I want to make sure I always have the stuff that I like to use. And they were very surprised by that and kind of impressed. As a matter of fact, the boom operator that is a, is a good friend of mine, he was like, I don't even do that. I might consider getting some of my own also for when I day play. It's kind of an kind of a, a interesting thing. Um, now, there are other things, and I, I won't necessarily go into it just now, but that gives you a couple of ideas. Now, I'll actually, actually, I'll go into one more thing. You, if you have anything that you like for planting microphones, you might consider bringing those too because planting microphones is a boom operator responsibility because you are technically a microphone placement technician. So putting a microphone out is something that it doesn't matter if it's in a car or outside of a car and you're holding a pole, you might consider having some things that, that can help you with that. And if you, don't, if you don't necessarily have anything, you know, I'm not saying, you know, Joe's sticky stuff that'll be surprised. That'll be supplied by the pro pro uh, production, uh, not production, by your sound mixer. I'm not saying top stick or anything along those lines, black paper tape. Those are always going to be supplied by your mixer. If you have anything in particular, though, that you like to mount plants to, or that you just, you might, it might have innovated something, that's the kind of thing that you want to carry with you from show to show because that's the kind of thing that mixers are all going to have their own different gadgets and gizmos. And if you do not like Magic Arms, for example, which I don't, then have your own other solution that you can use that does the same job, but that makes you happier. That's going to be great for you. Now, do you get money for it? Chances are if you're in a production city and your rate starts with a letter like Y, chances are you're not going to. But in markets that do not have a high a highly negotiate a higher wage with that starts with the letter y for example and those rates are the scale rates and usually double what it is in a non-production city then you may end up being able to negotiate a kit rental like if you're not in one of those production cities i mean you might be able to negotiate a kit rental that's something that you might even, if you're in a production city, on a very rare occasion after being on a show and being loyal to it a few seasons, you might actually be able to get a kit rental out of a show. But if you are getting a kit rental, it could be $10 a day if you have a very minimal kit. Chances are if you just have one boom pole and headphones, you're not going to be getting $20, $30 a day for it. Maybe $50 a week, $10 a day, something like that over the course of a show. 
might be something that you get paid for. As a matter of fact, I know of a boom operator who did three seasons of a show and the end of his boom, one of the segments broke. And he said to production, okay, well, this broke. I need to L&D. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. You're responsible for your own gear. And he's like, I'm not getting a kit rental for it. I've done three seasons with you. And they said, nope, sorry, not going to, not going to cover it. So he paid out of pocket that $200. Then he said, okay, let's talk about a kit rental. And the production ended up coming to him and saying, okay, well, what would you like? And he said $20 a day. They said, okay. And so for the rest of that 10 month long show, he, and, and, and later seasons, because I think he did two or three more after that, he ended up getting $20 a day for a 10 month long show. So because production who always loves to step over, step over dollars to pick up nickels or pennies, because they didn't want to shell out $200 to fix that boom operator's boom pole after two and a half seasons, they ended up shelling out $100 a week for a 10 month long show times six, well, times like three seasons and the rest of that one. Crazy, I know, but it does happen. But then, of course, that happened in a market that was not a production city. And if you are getting a rate that scale, that's going to be like less than half of the, the scale rate in a production city. That's when sometimes kit rentals are a way to get your rage up a little bit higher because sometimes producers will say, well, this is what we're paying. Well, your negotiated scale rate is here. I don't care if it's not a production city rate. I don't care. Your rates are established here. You can always increase those by negotiating and seeing what the production will actually cover. But as, as at a certain rate, they're going to, to, to cap and say no. And chances are that's not going to be a production city rate. And of course, unless you're working on a feature or a commercial, if you're doing television, forget about it. Probably not going to happen. But kit rentals are going to be a way that you can get, a, get it up a little bit higher. The best kit rental I've ever gotten was $50 a day. And that was on a show that I could not negotiate any higher than a certain amount. And I have a heck of a kit. I'll tell you, tell you this. It's nine booms. It has a lot of innovative uh, things that I've innovated for it. And so... Production had seen a lot of them because I, I have one of six of one type of boom that's in there that, you know, is one of six in America and it's the only one used in the film industry. And, you know, just rare things. I have hydrophones, I have gunshot mics because a lot of the times mixers don't carry that kind of stuff. And if I am going to be putting something out for gunshots or something like that, I want to use stuff I know and I, that sounds really good. And the stuff I have is stuff used by sound recorders that record gunshots professionally. So, of course, you know, if I end up using it because, you know, a mixer is going to be looking to me to, to catch, those, catch those gunshots and I'll say, okay, great. I'll run out what I think is going to give you great results. Because when I personally do something on a show, I want it to be a tip top notch. I want it to be to, to use it, use the stuff that I get best results with and the things that I feel most comfortable with, even if it means carrying around in my own kit. I don't always carry all of my gear on a show. Typically, if I'm on an episodic show, I'll look at the show and see, well, I do need this. I don't need this. I do need this. I don't need this. I'm about to start a show, for example, and I'm going to be taking maybe only about 25% of my kit. It's going to be like reshoots for a movie. So I may not end up, you know, carrying more than 25% of what I actually need, but then chances are a lot of those specialty items are not going to be necessary. I'll sure bring some of the things that I use for car plants, uh, even though I don't think we're actually doing any car work. Um, you know, things always change. I am going to be carrying multiple booms because I always like to have at least two that can do the same job. I, I, will, I will carry one that's maybe, you know, able to go up to maybe seven feet and one that's able to go up to 12. And both of those will collapse down pretty small. I also will have a couple of different options that, that can go up to like 18 or 20 feet. So that way I'm always covered as a backup. So if something does happen to one of them, I'll at least have a backup. As a matter of fact, I, I actually have duplicates of three of my main sizes of them. And as a matter of fact, as of the time of this video, I'm actually, uh, I'm not even renting them. A couple of my friends who have trained um, don't have their own poles yet, but they trained on my gear. So of course they like it and I've loaned them out. So something you can do. But as a matter of fact, a few years ago, those doubles and duplicates, one of my friends and mentors, actually, he had hit, he was doing something internationally. And uh, they ended up on that particular show having an issue with a couple of people stowed away uh, with the gear and tried to come over to America and were caught by customs. And they put a two-week hold on all the gear while, while they went through everything. So he was like, oh, my gosh, I don't have any booms. 
because the mixer brought his wireless and recorder and stuff like that with him on board and checked it. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but the rest of the booms and stuff were still coming back on the, on the, uh, the cargo ship. And that, he was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I have no booms. And they only held it up on Sunday. And here he is trying on a Sunday to find booms to do his work on Monday. Well, that was when he reached out to me just on a hunch. Maybe I would happen to be able to help him. And I said, yeah, I'll give you my backup set. Well, actually, I gave him my main set and I took the backup set because, like I said, he is my mentor and I think highly of him. As a matter of fact, even though he's had some of the same poles for like 20 years, he liked the newer series of pole that I was using so much that he started that he started upgrading his when when he uh, after he went back to his own gear because he was like, you know, I like this. Other, I like Alan's gear better. So he actually upgrades some of his own stuff. But um, anyway, I digress. Can you get paid for it? Yes, you can. Not necessarily in a production city, but you can elsewhere. And of course, if you do get paid, you're responsible for the upkeep of that gear. That's one of the downfalls. If I get any damage done to my equipment, I have to be prepared to pay out of pocket for it because if production is paying me for it, it's supposed to be covered under, under you know, the kit agreement. What I typically will do is I will scratch through the line that says on, on the kit agreement that says I'm responsible for it and I'll turn it in. Production has very seldomly caught that and griped about it, you know, uh, but I scratch through it when I sign it. And I'm not going to try to cheat production. I'm not going to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, do anything like that. Just if, if it's a regular wear and tear, I will cover it. No worries. But if it is actually damaged on the show, because of something, some dumb decision that production made or because another crew member broke it, I will certainly L&D it and, and hope that production does pay for it because I don't think that if I, if I break it, then obviously I'll fix it. I'll cover it out of my own pocket. But if someone else breaks my gear, then to me, I feel like production should, should cover it. Now, they don't always, but I feel that they should. Um, and that's the reason why I scratch out that line. And I don't know, I've only ever had it happen one time in production, you know, it never even came to a head. Production covered it. Um, it was when a, a shock mount got broken. Um, and uh, they just said, well, what does it take to replace it? And so they, they did it. But that was the one time I can think of where one of my pieces of gear got broken by somebody else. And I asked them to, uh, I asked L&D it and it was uh, not turned down. So, I mean, that's production being responsible, right? Taking care of its employees. Um, now the L in the L and D lost and damaged lost. If something is stolen gear wise, production will, of course, at that point, do some sort of a, a, you know, insurance claim on it and say what was broken and pick up, pick up the cost for it, uh, or, or what was, what was destroyed or what was stolen and pick up the cost for it rather. Um, that doesn't always, you know, uh, very seldomly does, is gear like that stolen. Usually it's not the entire sound trailer or you know entire bags taken but usually it's like one or one or more pieces of gear because they didn't have firewatch set up and you were out on location where there's a lot of people and somebody might have grabbed your set of headphones and walked away with it and of course if you can in that circumstance l and d it then by all means do but you don't necessarily get a get to get reimbursement for it because it's very difficult to prove something was lost or stolen rather but it does happen um technically Production can say you're responsible for your the safety of your own gear, and they can say that in the start paperwork. Just like they can say the same thing about their, the about crew parking, you're responsible for your own vehicle, and then have a very unsafe parking lot and not put a security guard out there. Sure, they can do that, and they can say you're responsible for your own stuff. Well, what are you going to do? If you want to work, you got to take the risk. And I mean, it doesn't make it right, but production can say no. I'm not responsible. I gave my disclaimer. You chose to do that. You could have taken an Uber. You could have ridden on sub in the subway today. Well, great. Um, but, but, you know, basically what I'm saying here is if you carry your own gear, it's because of the familiarity. Uh, familiarity. It's because you like it. It's because it helps you to do your job better. It's not because you need it to actually do your job because the sound mixer is providing you with gear that you can use. But that is something that you need to at least be aware of, that you are responsible for everything from the upkeep and maintenance, which you don't necessarily get paid to maintain, 
uh, you don't get a wrap day that you get to, to maintain. Like, not like the sound utility will be working with the sound mixer on wrap day to clean up the gear and get it ready for the next show. You don't necessarily get a wrap day. I have gotten wrap days before on shows that really like me, and they say, sure, we'll absolutely give you one. Sometimes, most of the time, shows will say, no, boom operators don't get a wrap day. But sometimes I've been able to say, uh, you've been giving me a kit rental. I've used a lot of stuff. Haven't you seen this and this and this and this and this and gone through it? Sometimes they may say, well, I've given you kit rental. You can, you can maintain your own gear. It really depends on the show. It depends on the circumstances and everything. But that is at least something to be aware of. If you have your own gear, you have to maintain it. Um, and if you do not have your own gear and you use the sound mixer stuff, you have to maintain it. So have your knowledge handy and what you need to do in order to maintain that gear. and. Um, Choose to get your own kit if you'd like to, because, you know, at least you'll have it from show to show to show with mi from mixer to mixer to mixer. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below, or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.